we can plug it in here. Hey, y'all, look, we're going to get started in about 15, 20 minutes. So this is what you're missing. Look, great networking opportunities. So if you are not here, you're missing out on a room full. These are our upcoming meetings. Here's an available deal we have. But look, you're missing out on a good room full of people. The speaker will get started in about 15 minutes, okay?
I was a full-time investor. All of those things combined, like I didn't come up from anywhere close to a silver spoon. I was looking at life in prison by the time I was 19. Coming out of that side, I started reading books. Through reading books, I got exposed to real estate. As my exposure to real estate grew, like my passion for it grew. My very first property I ever did at 23 years old, I pulled like $97,000 out of. For somebody that never had more than like a negative bank account in their entire life, $97,000 felt like the world. From there, I escalated by the time I was 26 at an 83 unit apartment complex in escrow. I've since completed multi-million dollar new construction projects. I've gone through and done mobile home development. I've done massive amounts of lining deals, shorts, flips, wholesales. I currently own about 70,000 square foot of commercial office warehouse. I've got a fairly expansive experience in my limited amount of time in real estate. All of that really comes from this. And this is what I lean everything back to. And that is essentially saying, if you want to leapfrog your experience in this industry, 
Pay attention to the people around you that have been in the industry and have gone where you want to go and just ask them for the roadmap. It, it's, it's really nothing more than A, B, C, D, E. And if you understand A, B, C, D, E, your ability to get to F is a lot easier. And if you're out there just trying to invent your own alphabet, it gets really difficult. But I've, I, I hold solid to this quote of basically saying, if you want to learn, follow other people's experience so you don't have to make the same mistakes. All of that moving forward, going through this, I'm going to ask an extremely douchey question right now. And what I'd like everyone in the room to do is not answer it. <laughs> but I want to ask it for a very simple reason because I want to put you in a mindset and I want to see how that mindset evolves as I continue through this presentation. How many multimillionaires do I have in the room right now? And this is not a raise your hand question. I just want you to answer this. How many multimillionaires do I have in the room right now? And as I continue to move forward through this presentation, I want to see how your thought process evolves. Okay? I'm going to get very deep. I've been investing since about 2006. I've associated myself with some rather intelligent people in that time so that way I could absorb as much of their knowledge as I possibly could. That to be said, I saw a lot of high level theory that I'd never ex been exposed to. I went through 2006, seven, eight, nine. I saw what happened during those times. I was also very, very involved in nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I saw what was going on in the market during that time. I was not educated enough to know what was going on at that time. But as my network grew, so did my knowledge. And as my knowledge grew, my investing mindset has completely shifted in the past several years. So I'm gonna boil this down and try and give you as much of this knowledge as I possibly can today. One of the key things that I'm gonna go deep in on this, and I feel sorry for this room right now because I do get fairly intensive with the data on my slides. I must first provide the data to you because I've realized that there's a lot of left brain people that will absolutely not believe anything I say unless there's data to support it. Real estate moves in cycles as does almost all markets. You will have flat markets, upward trending markets, downward trending markets. But I can express to everyone in this room, markets move in cycles. Now, if we start talking about equity markets, those tend to move faster. It's harder to time those. If you put it on a long enough timeline, a little bit of a different story. But if I look at history, the US housing market went through a cycle from the top to top from 68 to 78. <coughs> And then from 78 to 88. The dip in 68 was just a slowing of the economy. The dip in 78 come off the backside of OPEC. We started looking at 88, what happened in 88? SNL, the savings and loan crisis. All of this really affected our housing trends. We can see from here, we hit a top to the bottom, top 10 years. Bottom to the top 10 years. After the SNL crisis though, we didn't really rebound for almost 17 years. It took a while for that to pop back. Okay, all I'm doing is dropping some data. The key point that I want to provide in this slide though, is we move in cycles. Real estate typically moves in longer cycles. They don't normally last a month. It doesn't normally last two months. You normally have a cycle that spans past seven to 12 years. Okay, so we'll get some other data. The Glass-Steagall legislation was enacted by Congress back in 1933. Why is that important to you? I think it's extremely important to you. I'll explain more. I'm not going to explain a massive amount about that. If it intrigues you, I'd go out and study about it. But one of the key things that Glass-Steagall did was it repealed, or not repealed, it basically took investment banking and personal banking and said, y'all two should not be married to each other. Y'all shouldn't be working together. There's some, there's some conflicts of interest with the way y'all can operate stay away from each other. In 99, the Grand leach Bliley Act repealed almost all of it. We go back, I don't know if there's a coincidence, I'm not that intelligent, but around 99 is where we started seeing the market push back up again. There were some things going on with lending. There were some things that changed in the investment banking world, in my opinion, that helped spur that on. If I keep looking forward, this right here is the nominal housing crisis. That blue line starts from 1976 and goes all the way up to the end of January, or excuse me, it goes all the way up to January of 18. For those of you in the back that can't see that. But for the most part, I believe everybody in the room can see that that blue line was moving upwards. What I will also say is if I look at 99, which is right about here, what happened to housing prices right about that same time? 
started going way up. Is it a coincidence? Do your own investigations. I've done a lot of investigation personally on this. There's a lot of data that I could use to point towards where the money was coming from, where the money went, where the bailout money went, all of those types of things. I think that's something y'all should figure out on your own. But I'm gonna go through and just give you some, some feedback as to what's going on here. I'm gonna get real deep in this and then I'm gonna expose how this affects you. I'm gonna go through and do some technical analysis. Technical analysis is a term used, often used by stock, stock traders, option traders, forex futures. They look at data to try and predict the future. What I threw up here was these two green bars. Does everybody see that I put these two green bars on here? Those green bars are what I'm gonna call a channel. Prices historically stayed within that channel for over 20 years. They kind of moved up, but anytime they get towards the top of that channel, they would fall back. Anytime they got to the bottom of that channel, they'd go back up. Do not let yourself get confused, but I'm gonna teach y'all two new words here if you've never heard them before. I wanna use a word called support and a word called resistance. I'm going to give you all an example of how that works. I don't know. Let's use my favorite car here. Bentley Continental, S-Speed. That new car trades around $330,000, $340,000. That is the retail market price for a Bentley Continental. Can we all say $330,000? $330,000. All right. I want to ask a question. I've got a $330,000 Bentley, and I'll sell it to everybody in this room right now for five hundred dollars Anybody in here want to take that deal? Nope. Not a chance in hell you're going to take that deal. Why? <clears throat> the price is what? Too high. Too high. That's a resistance line. There is going to be a point in time where the price gets too high and people say, I'm no longer willing to buy it. Now let's talk about support. I'm going to talk about that exact same car. I'm going to offer that exact same car to you for $20,000, clean title, not stolen. Who wants to buy it? <laughs> I'm in a room full of investors and I saw one hand. So either A, y'all are not participating with me today, or B, you didn't hear what I said. $330,000 car, clear title, not stolen, I'll give it to you for 20 grand. Any your hands in the room? That is a very clear line of support. There will be a point in time where a price drops low enough that people are like, you know what? I'm comfortable at that price, I will buy. So what does support mean? Support means people are willing to buy. And what does resistance mean? Too high. Too high. When we look at technical analysis and I put a channel on a price trend like this, what I'm looking at is as the price starts getting close to that green, it reverts back down. As it reverts back down, it goes back up. And it kind of trends up there. That top line is your resistance line. The bottom line is your support line. Housing prices stayed in that channel for a very long time. Post-99, it spiked, and not only did it go outside of a historic, almost 30-year channel, whenever it peaked out of it, it went through the roof. When did the market pop? Right here. If anybody's been in, has anybody been in here and been investing for more than 12 years? Quite a few, more than normal. When this popped right here in 08, the market dropped. Now, if I look at a historical support line, where did the market find your support again? As soon as it touched that support line, it reversed back up. Let's look at some other interesting data. This is just data. This is just interesting little things that I find interesting. If I apply a new resistance line, if I apply a new resistance line, okay, so we had historically bounced off of this green line forever, and then we finally made it up to this, this yellow line. When we hit that line, it, re it bounced. And it came back, hit the support, and whenever it went back the other direction, how far are we from touching that line again? Not far. That was back in 18. We have touched that line. Okay. What is that for me? I'm guessing. I've been guessing at this now for six months. I've been doing this presentation for close to six months. Six months ago, I said, 2020 is going to be a recession. I said, in 2020, we will see problems in our financial markets. I said that in 2020... Something is going to happen. The equity markets are going to collapse and the housing market will follow in behind it. I've got a lot of other data points to look at to follow up on that. Those that cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. If you did not experience 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, that was a very interesting marketplace. A very 
interesting marketplace. And I'll get deeper into the weeds on that. Is anybody in here starting to feel a little concerned that I'm, I'm a doomsdayer? <laughs> I am not. But I've seen enough data points that make me feel like, hey, this is going to happen. And then surprisingly, and I guess it's a good time for this particular class, because normally when I do this presentation, I get a lot of people in the room that are like, you're foolish. Well, that to be said, what's happened to the Dow in the last two weeks? Volatility. VIX is up over 50 right now. Okay? With that to be said, guess what I've been hearing from my mortgage broker friends? Refis are starting to get pulled. Boom. Banks are pulling away. Interest rates are going different. What happened in 08, 09? The banks dried up their lending immediately. The market was too volatile for them to be part of it. So a lot of what I've been discussing for the last six months has been, over the last couple of weeks, starting to show its head. So while some people might consider me a doomsdayer, I would much rather say I look at data points that help me guide my motivated decisions. Okay? Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I saw this from 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And I'm going to try and give as much of my experience from 06 to today as I possibly can in this room. And I will show each and every one of you why, if this market does shift, you are in the absolute best time to take advantage of it. Okay? Move forward. Here's some other interesting data points, and then I'm going to start pulling away from data because I'm not a left brain thinker at all. I love seeing data. I hate, I hate building it, but I'm absolutely a gut guy. Like, my gut tells me what I want to do, and I move fast. There's a bunch of lines on here that most people cannot see, but you will likely see a really big one, and I'm going to tell you it's purple, that just pulls up away. That starts at around 2001, right here, and it starts pulling up. That is your national home price index. Home prices started going up then. We've already seen this on several charts. Home prices started going up again. 2008, we saw it crash. 2012 or so, we started seeing support again. Around the time that that crash hit, right, right here, I also see a red line. That red line starts getting away from the other lines as well. What is that red line? That red line is rent of primary residence. The blue line and the green line <laughs> are your average incomes. If we look for a long period of time, home prices, average income, and rents all trended together for quite a long time. Once the housing market peaked, did, did revenue go up with it? Were people making more money? No. no. <laughs> but when it popped, a lot of homes went into foreclosure. When a lot of homes went into foreclosure, what happened to those people? They became renters. 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 When they became renters, what do you start seeing happen to the rental index? It starts pulling away from the average income as well. We now have a flood of people looking to rent their property, looking to rent. They no longer own. You see a flood of rentals come out of 2008, 9, 10, 11. Okay? Is there a possibility that that trend continues at all? If it's getting that far away from the affordability index, is there a possibility that we could be moving? towards a rental bubble? I don't know. Only time will tell on that side. Just throwing out possibilities. I see a lot of pissed off people right now. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to ask questions. I am not a crystal ball. I do not consider myself to be educated in the slightest. I do not even have a high school diploma. All of those things combined, I try my best to associate myself with people that I, figure, I consider to be extremely smart. And all I do is mimic what they do. I just look at them and I'm like, I'm stupid. You're smart. I'm going to follow you. That's all I've done. And that is why I started out this entire presentation with that quote because I'm not smart enough to figure all that out on my own. I just find people that I consider to be extremely smart and watch what they do. Let's get away from that. This right here is a poll done by Pulse Economics in the Wall Street Journal. <clears throat> 59% of people, according to the Wall Street Journal, 59% of economists, according to the Wall Street Journal, feared that the economy would crash in 2020. Just to say that, economists have accurately predicted seven of the past three recessions. It's a joke. <laughs> but essentially, <laughs> economists don't know a damn thing. I don't know a damn thing. Really, timing a market really comes down to, there are some key indicators 
I see those key indicators happening. There are some other things that we could take a look at. We could take a look at household net worth versus GDP during the dot-com bubble, during the last housing bubble, during the industrial bubble. That always peaks, and when it peaks, we come to a recession. Well, we just hit another peak. We just saw the volatility hitting the Dow. We are starting to see the loans backing off. I really perceive that the year of 2020 is going to be a massive year of opportunity for real estate investors that are educated. Okay? Keep moving forward. If anybody would like to fact check me or look into any of this more on their own, two things I'd recommend you look at. The book on the left is a full-blown Harvard-level crash course on what happened in the last cycle. So a book written by an economist named Noro Rubini. Noro Rubini is often called the doomsday economist. He's always been a perma bear, like always bearish on the, on the market. All of those things to be said, I think he has every right to be perma bear on the market. The only thing I believe that has kept our market supported for this long is federal intervention, Fed intervention, central banking, monetary policies that have allowed this to happen. If we haven't heard about quantitative easing through 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, that was just massive amounts of money being printed. If you have not heard of quantitative easing, read up on it. It was the, the, the dropping of the, of the interest rates plus quantitative easing equaled essentially drugs for the market. It was just like, let me pump you up and make you happy. I'm not a doomsdayer. I'm just repeating previous history. Is that again quantitative easing? Easing, okay. They're printing off billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars of money, just printing it, just like, here you go, pump it into the economy. They're trying to get the money to move. That's not, that's, not, that's not me making stuff up, like quantitative easing, it happened. The Big Short is a funny yet very realistic story. It's pretty much the documentary of what happened in, leading up to 2008. So if you don't want to go through the time to read the book, Crisis Economics, watch the movie The Big Short. A lot of cursing, a lot of nudity, but overall it's an entertaining story. <laughs> All right, moving forward. I'm gonna get away from all of that crap. I'm gonna move forward to, okay, this is coming. There is a guarantee that it is coming. What I cannot guarantee is whether it'll be this year or 10 years from now, but I guarantee you it won't last another 30,000 years. The market will recede at some point in time. I personally think it's gonna happen in the next six months. All of that to be said, let's take a look at it. What does that mean to you as a real estate investor? And what is the title of this course? How to buy essentially an infinite amount of properties with limited to no capital. That is a very abused statement, but when you see the context that I put this in, I think you'll start realizing how simple that truly is when you understand cyclical marketing or cyclical markets, and then you understand the basic 12 acquisition and disposition strategies available to you as a real estate investor. When you have a very well-encompassing mindset of I'm a transaction engineer versus I'm a wholesaler, your ability to transact properties and acquire properties just becomes And knowing what each one of those strategies are and when they are best applied, I consider to be a very crucial part to being a solid real estate investor. Can you make massive amounts of money only knowing one strategy? Yes, you most definitely can. But one strategy is typically always best in one part of the market cycle. I'll go through and teach more on this. Can I pause on this for a second and just get some feedback from the room? Because <coughs> I feel like I lost every one of y'all already. No, I tend to do that. No, you're very keep going. Yeah. Okay. Everybody good? Like, anybody got questions up until now? I'm going to take a five-second break. I, I was wondering about your, um, just, I saw in the left corner, you did mention where you got your data. I'm just curious where, and I want to Really, you. what I do? Is, is nothing wild, like I tell people all the time. Does anybody in here want to know who my mentors are? Yeah. yeah one of my number one mentors and has been for quite a long time is you can look them up, Google. <laughs> <laughs> like straight up, like, like all of this data, like I'll just go to Google, real estate market trends. And I'll just start reading up every article I can find. I'll start looking at charts, graphs. I don't let people far smarter than mine. Like Robert Schiller, he's the Yale economist, the Case Schiller Index, like you'll see that up here. Uh, all of this says Case Schiller, Case Schiller. Gotcha. Schiller is a Yale economist. And I look at a lot of his a lot of his reports and stuff like that. So I am not smart. I just go to Google and I say real estate market reports. And I find articles that support it. I find articles that, that, that go against it. And I try to educate myself on as many different points of view as I possibly can. So that way I can come to my own conclusions. 
I didn't say that to be rude or anything, but like Google is like my number one friend. It's true. All right. Everybody else feeling really warm and fuzzy about this presentation so far? I promise you it's going to get better because I'm going to show you how this applies to you as a real estate investor and why you should not be concerned about a shifting market. I personally believe that as a real estate investor, that shifting market is going to be your biggest opportunity. So let's continue looking through this. Warren Buffett, a very well internationally recognized powerhouse of an investor, investing across multiple asset classes, that man has his hands in just about every asset class that he could possibly want to be in. I'd be willing to bet he trades Yeezys. Like the, the, guy, the guy, if he can make money on it, he's gonna do it. But one of the key things that he has always said is be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. When you see everyone else running into a market, you should be backing out. When you see everyone backing out of a market, you should probably be timing yourself to run right back in. Unfortunately, we as humans are really not that great at making an investment decision because we have a little bit of a problem called emotion. Emotions do not always do well with logical thinking. Emotions start saying, well, maybe I can just stay in a little bit longer, I'll get my money back. Emotions say, well, maybe I can just stay in a little bit longer and this will, this, 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 none of this will happen. Or, you know what, I'm not going to get in yet, it's not ready yet. You've got to separate emotion from your investments. All of these things to say, most people get in when it's all hyped up. Like when you start looking at Bitcoin. Bitcoin got all of the rage about a year and a half ago. Oh, you gotta get into Bitcoin, you gotta get into Bitcoin, you gotta get into Bitcoin. And it happened for about six months and everyone's screaming, you gotta get into Bitcoin before what happened? <laughs> Pop. If everyone in the world is screaming, go invest in it, you've already missed the bubble. You're basically riding the top side of that wave. But everything moves in Cycles. You've got to start paying attention to it. The real estate market is never going to disappear. Can Bitcoin disappear? That's debatable. Housing will always be around and it will likely always move in cycles. But as you saw when I asked the question, how many people have been investing for more than 12 years, you saw a very limited handful of people raise their hand. Why? Most people that are in this room did not experience 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Since you did not experience it, you do not remember what it was like and what happened. Let's go through this. The cycle of market emotions. As the market is moving up, you've got all kinds of excitement, optimism, excitement, thrill, euphoria. And at the very peak of the market cycle, right up here at the very top, is the point of maximum financial risk for an uneducated investor. An educated investor can make money where? At the top, yeah. at the bottom, trending up, trending down, flat, it does not matter. A sophisticated real estate investor can make money at absolutely any point of a market cycle, but they must shift their business practices to do so. Okay? But on the back side of a peak, you've got anxiety, <laughs> denial, fear, desperation, panic, hopelessness. And when you hit the very bottom of that cycle, that becomes your point of maximum financial opportunity. If you buy a flip right here, and you absolutely just bomb your numbers, you're over budget 50 grand, there's no way you're gonna be able to sell that on the market, what just happened? You just inherited a rental. And that rental is something you're gonna hold on to and you're gonna write off on your taxes with the depreciation schedule and all those other fun things. But once the market hits right there, what that just turned into? What? An asset value on your books with a positive equity on it that you get to turn around and sell. Your risk at this point in the market cycle is very minimal and most of the time can be cured with a long enough timeline. If you jump into a flip right here, you get your ass handed to you, what'd you just inherit? A write-off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah like for you, for you to really pull that off, you'd have to hold it as a rental, but you'd have to hold it as a rental all the way to over here. That's like a 10 to 12 year hold. What I'm trying to convey to you though is there are specific strategies when applied during these specific parts of a market cycle that will allow you to invest in a much simpler fashion. It will not be nearly as stressful 
and it will allow your net worth to grow at a rapid pace that you may have not been aware of. Like when we use the cycle to our advantage, one of the reasons why I like flipping is because I get to force appreciation. I go into an asset, I purchase it at a discount, I know what my repair costs will be, I'll create money like that. Well, if I can compound that with an appreciation cycle, I can get a natural appreciation wave combined with my forced appreciation, have massive amounts of the equity in the property, and I'll show you not only how to do that, but how to make massive amounts of money right here, make massive amounts of money right here, right here, 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 and here. I'll show you how to do it through all of these phases. That is one of the key things that I wanted to present to you while I was in this room today, is look at real estate investing on a 10-year plan. And then when you look at it on a 10-year plan, get a rather strong gauge of where you're at in the current market cycle, and then start applying and running your business as though you are, you are working a 10-year plan. 10 years to get filthy rich isn't that bad in my opinion. Okay? If I bored you, am I talking over people's heads? Do I need to answer some questions? Keep rolling. Keep rolling. I've got a couple of confident people in the room. I saw like three people like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll keep going. This is essentially a market cycle. I'm going to go through it. I'll say that was 2007 to 2018 as we hit that. I put 2019 as the peak. And then coming off the backside, we're going to have an early downturn, a late downturn, the bottom of a cycle, a recovery, early stable, late stable, and yet again another peak. I'll go through each one of those cycles and which strategies I believe are best applied in those cycles. I'm going to go through past history. Right after 2008, right when we started hitting this little area right here where the market started turning down, one of the first things that I saw as a real estate investor is lending dried up. Traditional lending got a little more difficult to get. Okay? With the lending drying up, does that mean that homeowners no longer want to sell their house? No. Does that mean that people no longer want to buy houses? No. 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 But what is an anomaly that is happening right there that is causing considerable amount of problems? If they bought right here, and now the market's just a little bit down over here. Do they have the equity they need to sell their home? No, they're underwater. They're stuck. They're stuck. A lot of people get stuck and during an economic downturn. What also happens? People lose their jobs. What happens when someone loses their job, they're underwater on their house, and the living environment is no longer capable of getting them a loan even if they did have equity in their home? As a real estate agent, what are you going to tell that homeowner? Short sale. Short sale. Push for a short sale. Who's going to live by it? Yeah. Loans are drying up. What we can do for that homeowner is what we call subject to investing. I will take over that property subject to the existing loan. In. I will take title to the property and I will make payments on that owner's behalf moving forward. So if they can no longer make the payments, they can't make that $818 a month payment, I will go into the homeowner and say, you have no equity in your home, you have no way of paying it, you're $3,000 behind on your mortgage, here's what I'll do for you. I'll give you $3,000 to catch up the mortgage, the title goes to me, the loan stays in your name, and I will have an obligation to pay your loan from this day moving forward. Outside of that, they don't have a lot of options to sell their home. You essentially become the only option. At that point in time, I have the ability to turn around and resell that property. I will use a wrap mortgage. I will take that exact same property, I'll turn around and resell it at a higher interest rate. Let's say the underlying loan was 200,000 at 4%. I will turn around and resell that exact same home for 210,000 at 9%. I just created 5% on $210,000 and I get 5% interest on that every single year. I see a lot of confused faces and I completely understand why. Mm -hmm. Subject to investing in wraps is a rather, rather um, 
detailed strategy. It is a very, I don't want to say very complicated, but there are a lot of moving <coughs> wheels in that strategy. Let me talk about that for a second. Do you all see where I'm going there? You've got a massive amount of people that can no longer afford their house. You've got a massive amount of people that no longer have equity in their house. And you have a lending environment that's not really susceptible to loaning money on houses as the market's doing this. Does a bank want to loan money when they know that the market is doing this? Not really. You can still get loans, but the criteria is going to be a lot harder to hit. As a real estate investor, you are there to do what? Solve if you're an educated investor and you understand subject to and wrap investing, do you see where this part of the market cycle could be very easy for you to acquire properties in? Every single one of those properties I take over subject to and sell on a wrap. When I sell it on a wrap, what asset do I now have? A note. I have a note. And that note has value. And the note has a massive amount of value. I'm now collecting 5% on that note. I'm collecting 5% interest on a $200,000 that I never had. It's called arbitrage. So one question on that is, you run into problems with the due on sale clause. Due on sale clause is discussed very heavily in that 33 video subject to course. <coughs> for everybody in this room that wants to learn subject to, how much am I gonna sell that to you for? Free what? <coughs> Free. I've heard two people say that. Is anybody else in this room agreeing that I'm going to teach you subject two? A full 33 video course over 18 hours. I'm going to teach that to you for how much? Free. Free. How many people in this room still think I'm full of shit? <laughs> A couple of you. 100%. It is taught from beginning to end. There is not enough sell in there. <clears throat> if you want to learn how to invest in subject two and wraps, the opportunity to is in there. I must explicitly say this though. Do not go out and watch that course and start investing in subject twos by yourself. By no means is that something that I recommend anybody ever do. A subject two wrap is close to a 30 year marriage times 20, 30, 40, 50 people, 100 people, 200, 300, 400 people. You have just now married 200 people for 30 years. To do this type of investing, you need a solid legal partner. You need a solid CPA, an RMLO, a note servicer, and an experienced party on your team. So do I have any, and I do not want you to raise your hand unless you've done at least a solid amount of subject to deals. Do I have any subject to investors in the room right now? <laughs> you said don't raise okay. What I need to say is, how many wholesalers do I have in the room right now? Raise your hand if you're willing to wholesale. Come on, guys. How many flippers do I have in the room right now? How many subject two specialists do I have in the room right now? Does anybody in this room, does anybody in this room right now understand opportunity? Yes. You just saw what your competition looks like. And if you do move into this portion of a market cycle, those deals will be abundant. Thousands and thousands and thousands of those types of properties will hit the market. Do you see how easy it could be to generate hundreds of notes making multiple, multiple upon multiple upon multiple um, arbitrage deals where you're collecting interest off of income? How many people would like to collect 5% off of 5 million bucks? That's not hard to do doing this. And then the notes themselves have value as well. Yes, sir. Who do you sell the notes to to get 9% when you... I'm getting 9% on the creation of the note. So like if I've got an underlying lien at 5% and I create a new loan at 9%, I have to pay the bank back 5% and I keep the 4% spread. So they loaned it at 5%. I created a new mortgage at 9%. I have to pay them 5 I keep 4 Who's the, the homeowner. So I'll turn around and resell the home. Remember, I said I'll take it for two hundred thousand, subject to, and I'll turn around and sell it for two hundred and ten. What I'm going to do when I turn around and sell it for two hundred and ten, I'm going to take ten thousand dollars down payment. Ten thousand dollars goes into my back pocket, recapture the three thousand that I had to pay in arrears. I'm a net positive seven thousand dollars. Seven thousand dollars goes into my back pocket for an upfront money. 
Average assignment fee, what are y'all getting right now on an average assignment fee? Five to eight. Five to eight. That's an average assignment fee you just got off of a zero equity deal that have a, of a pretty looking house. I'll then turn around, put that money in my back pocket, I'll collect arbitrage on the note, and then over time I can turn around and sell that note if I wanted to. So and the buyer that you're looking for is really somebody that can't qualify for a conventional yeah. loan probably, but they can afford it. Yeah. He would wrap it on a lease option. You know, like he would wrap it on a lease option right. to someone who would right. live in the house and who would refinance out. There's a and lot of options there. Loan so I am a Texas investor. Guess what I'm not allowed to do in Texas? Lease I'm not allowed to do lease options in Texas. Yeah, can people hear. argue that I can. I'm not going to argue about that. I personally would never do a lease option in Texas. But I would do subject to. So in states where you do have lease options as an option, right here, lease options still work really good. I personally, though, I'm of the opinion that if I can talk somebody into lease optioning me in the home, I could probably talk them into selling me to the home subject too. I'd much rather have the control and take it over sub two. That's me, though. We're talking about a buy sub two, wrap it on the back end with a lease option. Wrap it with a new note. No <coughs> lease option. No lease option on the back. You hear that, Mike? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. If you want to learn how to do that, though, 100% of everything I just discussed plus every little detail of in between is in that video series right now. If you want to watch that video series, where do you go? Propelio.com forward slash academy. That's P-R-O-P-E-L-I-O.com forward slash academy. That right there is about $20,000 of knowledge applied to you for free. I know it's about $20,000 because that's what I paid for it when I learned it. That was the guy that taught me how to do it. I convinced that man to do this for every single one of y'all for how much? Free. <coughs> Free. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you. Let's keep going. <laughs> Late downturn. Right here. The market has continued to slide. Continue to slide. Every home purchased from here to here is now underwater. Massive amounts of underwater houses. When you have a property that was purchased right here for $200,000 and you're now sitting in a market where that value is only worth $160,000, that's not really a subject to deal anymore. Subject twos can still be found right here. What is a good deal for subject to right here? A property that was purchased right here. Because there, you don't want super negative equity in a subject two. You want flat to, to, to slight negative to slight positive. That, that little range right there is where something is really good for you. Now, obviously, there's outliers of, of deal analysis and, and underwriting where you're saying, like, okay, we'll do that. But right here, sub twos are all these properties from right over here. But all of these, those are your shorts. I will go through and I will short, 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 short as much as I can right in this area right here. As we start getting towards the bottom, lending does start coming back. It's not like... For two years, banks just completely shut their doors. But underwriting does get a lot more difficult. But as we start seeing the bottom of the market, we start seeing support come back into the market, lending starts coming back to the market too. All of that to be said, I go heavy on shorts. What is a short? I'm gonna explain that real quick. Shorts are extremely easy to understand. All I'm doing with a short sale is I'm getting the bank to accept less for the property than what is owed. That's it. If the bank's owed 200 grand, I'll be like, I'm not going to give you more than 20. I will not give you more than 20 grand for that property. I don't care that you're owed 200 grand. I'll give you 20 for it. If the bank says yes, I just completed my first short sale. Obviously, there's some nuances and details on how to make that transaction occur, but that is a short sale. I remember my very first short sale, I could not believe. Property was purchased for 76,000, hadn't had a payment made on it for about five years, had about $120,000 in principal and arrears. I offered the bank about $6,000 for that house. After close to two years of negotiations, I finally bought it for 11. I wiped off over $100,000 in debt on that property and purchased it. Turned around and not even gut it. I just cleared all the hoarding out of it. And I turned around and listed it on the MLS and sold it for a little over 50. Really nothing more than four dumpsters worth of trash, made a quick 40 grand. Not too bad. I love short sales. I absolutely love short sales. But are you starting to see where opportunity somewhat really just becomes abundant at that point in time? How many people want to be flipping right here? 
I heard some people giggle. I didn't hear anybody raise their hand, though. Why wouldn't I want to be flipping there? Now, there's always going to be outlying cases. Always going to be outlying cases. But do I want flipping to be my primary investment strategy right there? The market's going against me. The market's going against me. I really don't want to be a flipper in a buyer's market. Can I? Yes. Do I feel like that is the best use of my time? No. There are other strategies that I can implement that will greatly increase my net worth far faster than flipping in a downward trending cycle. Where would I want to do capital producing strategies like flipping and wholesaling and new construction? Over here. The market's going with me. Like if I buy right here, I can, if I, even if I mess up, I can just wait a little bit longer. I can ride that wave of appreciation and my mistakes are covered in time. If I make a mistake over here, it's going to be a lot longer time. Okay? If you want to learn short sales, Melody Medley has processed a ton of short sales for me. That video course on short sales, while it is short, being six videos long, she has processed well over 800 short sales. She's a very knowledgeable short sale processor. If you would be interested in learning that, where can you go? Yep, and how much is it? Zero. Yep, there you go. Let's keep going. At the very bottom, for those of you all that are not interested in all these creative financing terms and you're willing to sit on the sidelines while the market's moving sideways, that's fine or down, what can we really do right here? Bye, bye, bye. Bye, 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 bye. <coughs> Remember this little chart right here? What is this? That is the point of maximum financial opportunity. <coughs> buy, 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 buy. Buy. That is what you do right there. How are we going to buy? OPM. As much as you possibly can. Remember the remember the, the title to this course, Buy an Infinite Amount of Property with No Money? What did I tell you you could do right here? Subject to and sell with a no. wrap. No. How much money does it cost for me to do that? Little to no. Little to none. Little to none. I can buy hundreds and hundreds of houses without a dime of my own dollars. Okay, whenever I go to acquire these properties, are they likely going to have arrears? Yeah. Past due payments? Mm -hmm. Yes. Whenever I turn around and resell them with a wrap, will I collect a down payment? Yes. Yes. Should that down payment be sufficient to cover the arrears and closing costs? How much did that house cost me? Zero. Zero. Do I technically own the house? Yes. But I own a whole bunch of notes. I'll generate and create and purchase, and essentially create massive amounts of notes right here with a team. I do not do that by myself. <clears throat> right here, shorts. Go through. Massive amounts of short opportunities there. Can you wholesale a short? Sure. Is it easy? You gotta know what you're doing. But moving from there, what opportunity opens up right here? Lending comes back. And when lending comes back, I can use the world famous Burr. Burr, what's Burr? You buy it, you rehab it, you rent it, you refinance it, and then you repeat the process again. Any investors from 2009, 10, and 11 in the room. What I saw as an investor during that time, and what I absolutely kicked myself in the ass for, is not realizing the opportunity that I had. That was a very solid buyer's market at that point in time. There was plenty of assets hitting the market. The foreclosures were rampant. REOs were all over the place. Vacant properties all over the place. It was a very interesting market. That to be said, it was definitely a buyer's market. There were plenty of assets available on the MLS at 70 cents on the dollar. It was not hard to find and acquire properties during that time. It was not. So if I could go to the MLS and acquire properties at a very low loan to value, I could go there, I could acquire them, and I can do a full remodel on them. I can purchase them with a hard money loan. 
I'll do a full remodel on it. Make sure the roof's good. Make sure the air conditioning system's good. Make sure the hot water heater's good. Make sure that I've got a good cosmetic remodel on it. And then what am I going to do? I'm going to rent it out. And then after I rent it out, I'm going to refinance it. And when I refinance it with a bank, it was not impossible to find a lender that would loan to you on an 80% refi. They had refinanced the property at 80% of its after repaired value. Well, if you purchased it all in at 70% of its after repaired value, by the time you have refinanced this property, where does that extra money go? If I buy it at 70 cents and I sell it, or if I refinance it at 80 cents, there is some excess capital there. I'm refinancing it for more than I bought it for. That money goes into my back pocket. Tax free. Tax free because it's a loan. How much money did I have to pay for that house? You might have had to come out of pocket for some capital to get the thing going. You may have had to pay some points. You may have had to pay some closing costs. You may have had to bring some money to the table. But then by the time you've refied out of it, your capital exposed is limited to none. Burr worked extremely well from 2009 till about 12. Around 2012, the market started tightening up. It started shifting back to a seller's market, and the ability to get 70 cent deals started getting tougher. Not impossible, just tougher. But during that point at the bottom, opportunities to burr were abundant. Now let me expose you to a totally different thought process, and I'm not gonna get into the flow of money, where the money came from, where the money went during the last cycle, because I find it to be horrific. I really do. Like, there was just thousands and thousands and millions and millions of people getting their lives destroyed, and, um, that's, uh, that's what it is. As real estate investors, though, I believe that we have the opportunity to fix that in a lot of ways. That is why I plan on creating what I'm creating when I talked with you all about earlier. All of those things combined, though. Let's talk about Walmart for a second. Walmart is in the retail business. They take product that they get at a discount, they turn around and sell it for a profit. Core of just about any retail business. You buy at volume, you sell it at a discount, or you sell it at retail. As a flipper, do I got anybody here that likes to flip? I love flipping. It's one of my favorite strategies. I've only got a handful of flippers in the room. I have that or, once again, people are not participating. I love flipping. As a flipper, what must you have access to? Inventory. Inventory. Are you a flipper without inventory? Nope. No, you are not. If you are going to flip, the inventory that you acquire must come at a discount. When you are at this point of a market cycle, how easy is it to acquire inventory? It's really not. It's a lot more difficult to acquire a substantial amount of inventory at the peak of a market. Can you acquire inventory? Yes. If you're an extremely experienced investor with a very solid network, can you continue getting inventory? Yes. Most people that are not in that position, when they get to a peak of a market, they'll start flipping right around here, and they're doing good. They're making a bunch of money, and they're like, wow, this is crazy. And then they get to here, it gets a little tougher. And then they start deciding they'll become wholesalers as well as flippers. And then they get to right here, and they're like, holy crap, it's extremely hard to get deals. I'm just going to trade margins for volume. Instead of doing a 70 cent deal, I'm going to start doing 88 cent deals, and I'll just make $10,000 off of every deal I do, but I'll do 100 of them this year. I can tell you from experience, I can tell you from watching and talking to many of people that went through that same thought process, bankruptcy. That's what you're going to end up in. You're starting to try to trade high volume at low margins, especially at, a, at the height of a market cycle, you'll get caught with your pants down. Do not do it. You're gambling. But if I am wanting to flip, and I am wanting a solid volume of discount properties right there. Let me introduce to you what I would anticipate and what I would suggest anyone in this room doing, especially with us moving towards what I would consider to be a reversal in the market. Let's talk about that. What does Walmart do? They purchase massive amounts of inventory at discounts and they put it on the shelves in the back office or in the back storage room and then when the shelves get depleted, what do they do? They carry it from the back door, put it up to the front, and you're good to go. They have stock. 
as a real estate investor that is looking to make massive amounts of money flipping, where do you buy your inventory? Right here. I'm not establishing a rental portfolio. I have no desire to be a single family landlord forever. But what can I do right there? If I've got properties that I'm essentially acquiring at 70 cents on the dollar, refining out at 80 cents on the dollar, I've got an inventory of properties at this phase of the market cycle at 80 cents on the dollar. If I see a 40% appreciation wave over the next seven years, I've now got a massive inventory that is sitting at close to 30 to 40 cents on the dollar. Has they, have they all been remodeled already? If you bird, yeah. Yeah. When I bird it out, I took care of all the deferred maintenance and I made it a solid asset. Why did I do that right here? Because the market is flooded with massive amounts of inventory. If I am going to now accommodate all of these tenants that are moving into the marketplace, I want the best product available at the best price so I can attract what? The best possible tenant. I do not want this wave right here to be a bunch of pissed off tenants. So I'm going to completely remodel the house up front and I'm going to secure the best possible tenant that I possibly can. And what I'm hoping for is that I can take that one tenant at the bottom and keep that tenant over the next five to seven years. Try to keep my turnover as low as I possibly can. All that I'm asking out of that tenant is to do what? <clears throat> to pay off my mortgage. So now I'm getting amortization out of the deal. What else am I going to be able to get from the IRS? Depreciation. Depreciation. I'll be able to write off depreciation against my earned income. What else will I be able to get out of it? Cash flow. What else will I be able to get out of it? Leverage. Leverage. I'll hedge against inflation. Inflation continues going every single year. They learn how to recalculate it about every six months, so it doesn't sound as bad as it is, but inflation's going. Well, I'm paying back the bank inflated dollars against quality borrowed dollars. So I get inflation, amortization, depreciation, cash flow. I get all of that out of that rental. And I'm going to hold that rental through what? That appreciation wave. And what do I have right there? A massive inventory of extremely discounted properties that need limited remodel to do what? Turn around and capitalize. I'm just going to throw some very simple math out there. Very simple math. If I get a bunch of assets, let's say at this point in time, and I'm not exaggerating, picking up at least 50 of these is not a big deal. You're going to need to be lendable and or partner with someone that's lendable. The best investors I've ever met, the best entrepreneurs I've ever met are resourceful people. All they do is see what has to be done to get this done, and they find either the will within themselves to do it or with someone in their network to do it for them. You can always sit right here and be like, oh, man, I can't get a loan. I'm bankrupt over here. F that. Partner up with someone that can. Quit making excuses. Excuses do nothing but rob you of opportunity. I'm going to use easy math, easy numbers, and I'm going to say you buy 100 properties right there. That is not extremely hard to do. It's going to be some work. I'm not going to sit there and say you're going to do it in your grandma's basement in your undies. You know what? You're going to be putting in 50, 60 hour weeks for the next couple of years. But if I hold at least, if I bought them all in at 80 cents, and they're worth 100 grand, that's 20,000 in equity on that property. Yeah? I turn around and sell it, I got dispo costs and everything else, but we're just throwing some numbers out there. $20,000 in equity times how many properties? 100 of them. Your balance sheet, your net worth just shows $2 million on your assets. Do y'all follow that? Mm -hmm. How hard was it to make that 2 million? 60 hour weeks for a couple of years. I know plenty of people that have done 60 hour weeks for their entire life and didn't make anywhere close to that. When you figure out the knowledge and you apply your knowledge, what's the difference between making, I'm going to use an analogy that I learned from Kiyosaki. When you're a little kid and you hear the ice cream truck chugging down the street, you get all excited, man, them endorphins are pumping, you're like, damn it, I'm going to give me a bomb pop. You go crazy, running around the house, ripping apart the couch. What are you looking for? Change. You're looking for some money. You're going to get some change. You spend the next five, six, five minutes, whatever it ends up being, and you find your 50 cents, you haul ass out the front door, you're excited. And then the next time you hear the ice cream truck, you figured out the process. You figured out how to make 50 cents in five minutes. You get to be 11 or 12 years old, you're going to school, you see somebody else wearing some really cool clothes, and you want some of those $100 pants.
you go running back to mom and dad and go, hey, mom and dad, I want, I want, I want some new pants. Okay, here's 20 bucks. No, they're 100. Well, screw that. You're going to mow the yard or something. You know what? You're now forced to do what? You go out and mow the yard a couple times. And then at 12 or 13 years old, you learn how to make 100 bucks. And then you get to be 16 and you want a car, and there's no way that they're buying you a car. You know what? You decide you have to go out and get a job at Albertsons for stock and groceries or whatever. You learn how to make 300 bucks a week. And then you go to high school, you get out of high school, and you go to get you a part-time job, you learn how to make $1,000 a week. And then you go to college, and you get out of college, and you learn how to make $1,000.50 a week. <laughs> Plus, you got a bunch of debt, which means you make less money. But you come out the backside of all of that, and essentially what you're doing is you're expanding your context. You're exposing your mind to how to make more money. And what normally happens is someone either hits their ceiling, and no one helps them past it, or they hit their comfort zone and they never push past it. What's the difference between making $50,000 a week and $500 a week? Resourcefulness. Mindset. It's all in your mind. I've got a $50,000 a week mindset. That is not something absent of everyone in this room. I've just been exposed to it. I have applied my thought process and my energy to $50,000 a week mindset. All you have to do is expand your context to absorb more content, and your ability to grow and expand and to create more wealth is available to you. Most people get lost in or cannot imagine. Can people imagine making $50,000 a week? Yes. Many people cannot. Oftentimes, whenever I'm speaking with people, especially on a one on one thing, and I'm talking about like, yeah, like, couple hundred thousand dollars a month not a big deal like here's the basic plan on how to do it they absolutely will reject the plan because they cannot even believe that the outcome is possible it is that foreign to them I had a conversation with somebody I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that in my future um, in, in future in further on in my, pre, in my presentation but I asked her I'm gonna open the world up to you you can have anything in this world you want dream as big as you can go what do you want out of this life the furthest her dreams could go because of how jacked up her life had been was to be able to rent a house, not even own a house. Like her dreams stopped at being able to rent a house near a beach and own a Jeep. That was the furthest her dreams could take her because she thought of so little of her self-worth that it could ever be more than that. I find many people have the ability to go further than they've ever been, but they limit themselves on where they believe they can go. Their potential is far further than their own beliefs. So you must first shift your beliefs to, okay, it's possible. Here's the steps, and then start applying those steps. At the bottom, we're gonna go through, do Burr, property management courses are available to you. I do not have a Burr class yet. I will be teaching the Burr class here before long. I've got a couple people that I believe are gonna do it. But right there, if you want to learn property management and rentals, there's two very key classes on both of those strategies right there. Hey, Daniel. Yes. About 15 minutes. All right. 15 to 20. Well, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to move forward through this. Don't worry about it. It's all in the Pelio Academy. Pelio.com forward slash academy. Every single one of those are there. There's about 35 courses in there, all the way from apartment investing to mobile home investing. It's all in there. Buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Definitely go through and do that. On the recovery, this is where I start doing my flipping. Right here, this is when I get really heavy on flipping, especially if you've never flipped before in your life. You can completely mess up right there, and you've got a fairly good cushion because you're moving into an upward trending cycle. If you completely bust it up, hold it as a rental, keep it for the next five years, you'll likely have equity in it, and you don't have to take the L. Moving forward from there, fix and flips, contracting, Two both very good solid little courses there. Moving forward, when I get into early stable, when I'm right here, getting 70 cent deals is fairly simple. As I start getting here, the market's starting to shift more to a seller's market. The deals are not as easy to get, but you can still get them. That is where I see wholesalers bringing the most value. Wholesaling right in this little area. You can wholesale at any point in any part of this cycle. So if you're wholesaling, you can wholesale at any point in time. Absolutely any point in time. But right there is where I see <clears throat> where I see wholesaling being the most prominent. That is also likely where I'd start shifting my strategy to going to infill lots and going vertical on, on new construction. Like right there, as you're 
as your off-market 70 cent houses are starting to get a little more difficult, people aren't normally farming land right there, I'd start looking for infill lots. I'm constantly trying to stay ahead of the curve. Right here, I'll start going after infill lots and going vertical. And I've probably got a three or four window where I can go vertical and not have to be exposed and risking it to the market. I'd go vertical right about there, new construction. That's my ugly ass on top of the house framing going up. I've done several multi-million dollar new construction deals. Moving forward, late stable. Late stable is where I'd start being a little more cautious. Be a little more concerned about what I'm going to be doing with my capital. I'm still going to stay in the market because because there's no point in not. You can make money at any point in any market cycle. You just got to be a little more cautious. I underwrite my deals differently there. But during that time, I'm going to go through. I'm going to stress test my portfolio. All those properties that I bought at the bottom, I'm going to go through. I'm going to analyze that portfolio. And I'm going to say if the market drops 30 percent, if rentals drop 20 percent, and I have to hold this asset for another seven years, do I still want it? Yes or no? Because if I don't let it go right now, I might have to hold on to it for another 10 years. My whole point to that, though, is I'll look through my entire portfolio and I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to get rid of 60 of my 100 properties. I'm going to take those 60 properties and I'm going to take it and I'm going to sell it. Remember, when I first bought them, how much equity did I have in each one? 20 grand. I just watched a 40% appreciation wave. They're all now worth 140 grand. Does that sound impossible for anybody that's watched what's happened to the market in the past 10 years? Does that sound like 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 BS? It happened across the nation. Forty thousand dollars plus the sixty I already had. That sixty thousand in equity I have in every one of those properties. I'm about to sell off sixty of them. That's about a little over three million bucks of liquidity right there. You're going to put back into your back pocket. How am I going to sell it? Could I take them straight to the retail market? And what am I going to do when I take them straight to the retail market? I'm going to take a 6% haircut right off the top from a real estate agent. I'm going to have to pay title fees. I'm going to pay all that other stuff. How can I maximize my sale on that? Let me give you a little, another little piece of information. Right here, this is where we're at right now. Right here, private capital is rather abundant. It is somewhat easy to get private capital at that point in time. Why? Because the deal volume is low. There's more money than there is deals. When you get to right here, let me tell you what happens. Deal volume is massively abundant. Tons of deals available in the marketplace. And what happens? Money disappears. Money seesaws. Plenty of money up here. Opportunity all through this area. Money starts getting harder to come by right around here. Well, when you're sitting at the peak of a market cycle, and there's a lot of money sitting on the sidelines, what you will start finding is Lots of capital willing to park itself for a four to six percent return. What do I mean by four to six percent return? I'm talking about cap rates, capitalization rates. What we will find is high net worth individuals are looking for what? Depreciation and write offs. They will park $400,000. Why? Because they've got $50 million. $400,000 doesn't mean a lot to them. They'll park $400,000 and they'll buy a turnkey rental. And they'll buy it at a four cap. Four cap means they're expecting to make 4% on that capital. And they will just let that asset run to the ground. And why? They're just going to write it off. It's a totally different mindset. It's a totally different mindset. It's a totally different type of investment. But if I go to the top of the market cycle and I take my entire portfolio and I start bundling up into packages of 10 and selling them off to turnkey investors, I can get prime dollars for them. And I can save a considerable amount of money on the backside. All of that's taken into consideration. I'm moving towards liquidity because I'm looking for liquidity to take advantage of the next dip in the market cycle. <clears throat> I just laid a multi-million dollar mindset on each and every one of y'all. What did I tell y'all earlier? The difference between making 500 bucks a week and 50,000 a week was. How many multi-millionaires did I just create? All it's going to take is action. But I didn't tell y'all a bunch of hocus pocus crap. I didn't come in here and sell you some 997 course to come in there and learn how to, how to short sale. I am exposing <clears throat> massive amounts of knowledge to each and every one of y'all. I have invested a massive amount of my own capital, of my own net worth, of my own time into creating the Propelio Academy. The Propelio Academy taught you how to do how much of that? All of that. How much did that cost? It cost a massive amount of money. 
It was not free. It cost me, my investors, my partners, massive amounts of money. And I'm giving you access to every single one of y'all for how much? Free. Okay. Now, for anybody that is interested in learning more about that, I recorded like a seven video series on YouTube. If you open up YouTube on your phone and just search for Propelio, subscribe to the Propelio YouTube channel. And then if you want to do a search, search for Propelio 2020 Recession. I've got like an hour and a half long video where I get really deep into all of this that we just talked about. And you can go through, like, do a refresher. Like, holy crap, Daniel just jumped up 12, 13 years of investing knowledge on us today. Many of y'all may have not been prepared for that much knowledge to be dropped on you. You can go back and watch that video course all by yourself at your own leisure. The first video is the 2020 recession. And I've got, like, video one, video two, video three, where I dive in for about an hour on each segment of that cycle. Hey, Dan, today I just posted one of those videos. Mm -hmm. So there's at least one starting point if you go awesome. to, the, to the Facebook page. So if any of you guys saw that video today, that can at least get you watching That'd be them. perfect. That'd be perfect. If anybody wants to keep up with me on social media, go to Facebook. Search for Daniel Chad Moore. I've always got a black hat on. Always. Mm -hmm. Go out there. You can find me. Uh, beyond that, I'll continue moving forward. Recap. We can go through there. Wholesaling, I teach that course on wholesaling. You can wholesale at any point in time. If you don't have, if, if remember I told you at the end you want to move to liquidity to take care of the, take advantage of the next cycle? Some people in this room may have been like, well, damn, I don't have any houses, I don't have any liquidity, I'm screwed. No. As that market is turning, wholesale your little ass off. You do an average of an $8,000 assignment. Well, if you do two assignments over the course of six months, that's 16 grand. How many subject two deals could that pull off for you if you're partnering up and doing a solid deal? Don't let excuses happen. You might not make $8 million on the next downturn, but you might make yourself $1.5 million. $1.5 million sounds pretty good for five years. Take that $1.5 million, and guess what you're prepared for? Cycles. Everything moves in cycles. Everything moves in cycles. Multiple different asset classes. Like, I can play around in Bitcoin. I can play around in the equity markets, Forex, futures, options, bonds. I can play around in single family homes. I can play around in mobile home parks. I can play around in mobile home houses. I can play around in multifamily. I can play around in office warehouse. I can play around in any asset class that I want to. Not all asset classes trend at the same rates. Learn to be a cyclical investor and learn to invest in numbers. When people ask me what do I invest in, I say numbers. It's all that matters to me. I don't give a damn if it's a tent. If someone tells me that the tent's worth 500 bucks and I can buy it for five, I just bought a tent. I'll flip a tent. <laughs> I don't understand why some people are like, oh, I won't, I won't do a condo. I won't, I won't do a townhome. I'm like, why? Look at the numbers. I won't work with mobile homes. Well, I'm glad because I make a lot of money on them. Please don't. I love mobile homes. Hey, Dan, don't forget the book. Uh, oh, yeah. Whenever. Yeah. Now, now I'm stuck without a question. I, look, my problem every time, I tell you. I'll pull it up here. All right, um, let me continue moving forward. I don't got much longer, but this is one of the things that I said to my partners and to the people as I started moving this forward. It's like, I did very well for myself in a short period of time. I did very well for myself in a short period of time. How do I say that? I'll talk about that in a little bit. I'll talk about that in a little bit. We'll move forward. Coming off the back side of that, I developed Propelio. Me and my co-founder, Nate Worcester, we started Propelio. Um, Propelio is essentially a software platform for real estate investors. We provide comps, we provide lead lists, we provide a driving for dollars app, we provide turnkey investor websites for your business. So if you have no technological experience on your background, but you want a lead capture page for your real estate investing business, five minutes or less, I can get you a website, comps, all those types of things. I want to go ahead and say right now, for anybody in the room, do y'all mind if I talk about Propelio for under five minutes? Definitely not. All right. If anybody in here has ever struggled with comps, please raise your hands. A couple of people. Anybody in here want lead lists? A couple of people. Anybody do driving for dollars? I personally think that driving for dollars is probably one of the best acquisition strategies available right now. Going beyond that, if you've ever struggled with technology and you don't want to deal with the headache of creating your own website, Anybody in here be interested in getting a website done for them in under five minutes? A couple of people. 
I have the ability to do all of that for you through the Propelio platform. Now, how many people in here would subscribe to the Propelio platform if I told every single one of y'all it was free? Four people. I'm glad I invested my time. In <laughs> Let me see you raise the hands if you would do it if it was free. Okay. Now here's that good old salesman coming out. I do not require a credit card to sign up for Propelio. There is no sign up, forget to cancel, and then get charged. Does anybody get tired of that? Like you go to a website, you check it out, and you're like, you know what, this isn't for me and you forget to cancel, then you have to go through the BS of trying to get a refund and trying to get the account canceled and going through all of that. I do not require a credit card to get your Propelio account started. You have a 14-day free trial. In your 14-day free trial, you have full access to the lead lists. You have full access to MLS comps. You have full access to the Driver for Dollars website. You have full access to check out and create your own websites so that you can see how Propelio functions for you. So. As a real estate investor, I consider your ability to make a split-second decision to be critical. You need to be able to make a decision and make a decision fast. What is your risk on trying out Propelio? Zero. Zero. How many people in this room believe I've provided some value today? A couple of people. Yeah. All that I ask yeah. out of you is to go back home and try out Propelio.com. You have zero risk in that. You know what? You want to run a comp tonight. Go home. Check it out. You know what? You want to try out some lead lists. You want to see if there's some vacant properties around here. You go into Propelio and say, show me all the vacant properties in New Orleans. Show me all the vacant properties that are also absentee owners in New Orleans. Show me all the vacant, vacant, vacant properties that are absentee owned out of state. Propelio, I can get you all of that data. So if you think that I provided some value and you'd like to reciprocate and show me that you appreciated what I did for you today, I would like to see at least 70 new trials in Propelio tonight. <clears throat> I hope that y'all can at least give me that. Okay? I'm going to move forward from here. That's all I've asked for you. There is zero risk in that. Zero. There is no chance you're going to be charged outside of you saying, I want to buy Propelio. Here's my credit card. Thank you, Daniel. I'm going to go forward. Y'all have heard a lot. Here's a little quick look at the interface. Here's your motivated seller's tabs. I've got, over, I've got about 125 million property records in the United States. Going forward from there, there's your comps interface. Got a simple little lead manager on there where you can keep up with track of your data. You got websites, that's what your websites would look like. Obviously you can put a logo up at the top and not just say Propelio Properties, but overall, simple, clean website. That's what the Driving for Dollars app looks like. I've got a couple little bugs in the app right now that I'm working on getting fixed, but I am getting them fixed. Going through there though, Here's a very critical thing that I want everyone, in the, everyone to ask themselves right now. Because one of the things that I've said more than once in this presentation is, I'm giving you hundreds of thousands of dollars in real estate investment education, and how much am I charging for it? Has anybody in here ever spent more than 10 grand on education? Raise your hand. Has anybody in here ever spent more than 15? More than 20? More than 50? More than 100? I've got over 100 grand in my real estate investment education big chunk of that was lost money. Con artists flying around, really doing nothing but trying to extract as much money out of your back pocket as they possibly can and leaving you high and dry without half of the information that they promised you. I'm not making a blanket statement, I'm speaking on truth. Has anybody in this room ever experienced that? Apparently at least half a dozen people in this room. Going through, how much would you charge to save someone's life? How much would you charge? You know what's sad? Is that there's a price on that. That's where we've gotten as a capitalist society. <clears throat> I am a capitalist. I am 100% for capitalism, and if you don't like that, I'm apologizing up front for it. But I'm proud to be a capitalist. What I believe is the error in capitalism is the I win, you lose mindset. I don't believe that that is true capitalism. You do not have to lose for me to win. I can win. You can win. How many real estate investors create win-win situations for their sellers? If you're a real estate investor, you should be creating win-win scenarios for your sellers. Mm -hmm. Is that a I win, you lose proposition? I do not believe in the mindset of for my business to thrive, yours must fail. Right. That's 
But we are at a point in the world where there is a value to someone's life. I know how valuable this knowledge is. That knowledge has changed my life. That knowledge has changed the lives of many people that I know. I spoke earlier and I said something. I said, you know what? How do I say that? I'm trying to, I'm trying to be very careful with the words I choose. From the time I was about three till I was 13, I was extensively abused. Massive physical, massive amounts of physical abuse. After going through that, my ability to perform at school was what? Zero. I was kicked out of just about every school I ever went to. From the time I was in sixth grade, kicked out. Seventh grade, kicked out. Eighth grade, kicked out. Ninth grade, kicked out. Till I was just completely kicked out of school. I went to every alternative school that was available in Fort Worth ISD. Through that, my testing came back as a very competent individual, but with all of the abuse I was experiencing at home, my life just wasn't all there. My sister was injecting heroin by the time she was 14 years old. I was 11. I got to watch this. My brother was doing the same thing. My father was doing the same thing. My household was full of heroin addicts. All of that to be said, I was suicidal from the time I was 11 till now. It's never changed. Ever. All I had experienced through most of my life was pain. I never saw a childhood. You do not get your ass beat by baseball bats, golf clubs. You do not get strapped into bench vices and go to school the next day cheerful. So why do I provide this type of education? Why am I willing to expose this amount of power to the world? I've got the words abandoned tattooed down the side of my leg. I've got the word betrayed tattooed down the side of my other leg. I've got the word surrounded in a load tattooed around my ankle. Growing up in that environment, growing up through what I went through, I saw massive amounts of pain through my brothers, my sisters, my friends, the people that allowed me to sleep on their couches. While I was watching my sister go through overdose after overdose over overdose, it eventually killed her. Not only killed her, killed my brother as well. I saw nothing but people disregarded by this society because of their economic status. I am tired of seeing that in this world. I am going to expose the education to this world required for those that lack opportunity but aspire and have hope that do not have the money in their back pocket to perform. I will give them the opportunity that they want and desire and absolutely deserve because unless you've experienced what it's like to be in the lower socioeconomic status of this world, then I do not necessarily know if you do or do not understand struggle. How many people in this room understand what it's like to grow up without hope? That is sad. That really is. And I'm not saying that as a pity party. What I'm saying is if you desire a change in your life and you want to see something outside of the grind of nine to five, going home, a single parent trying to support three kids, watching your life drown away, I am providing the opportunity to you, and that is how exactly how much I'm going to charge you to do it. Because your life is not a monetary value to me. Some people will say, oh, you're just doing this as a funnel for Propelio. Well, damn right. Propelio does get some benefit out of this, but could I have sold that for 100 bucks a month? Could I have sold that for 100 bucks a month? How many people in here spend over $20,000 on education? Yeah. Could I have sold that? Yeah. I absolutely could. <laughs> The simple fact that I provided it for free has actually ostracized me from this community. There are many people extremely upset about the fact that I have provided this for free because those people are making millions of dollars a month selling the education that I am now providing for free. I've been blacklisted from many of many of many of conventions within this community. Bigger pockets being one of them. I truly want to see a change in this world beyond that of what I might even be capable of doing. No way. But going through, my why. Now I want to be very precise and clear about this. I want to be very precise and clear about this. Growing up without materialistic things, my desires were materialistic things. 
I wanted the big ass house, the fancy car, the private jets. I wanted to show off and prove to the world that I was somebody. Because my entire life I was beaten and told I was a lazy, worthless piece of shit. All of that combined, all of that thought process put together. When I first started out, I wanted a house like that. That's not my house, but that's what I wanted. I wanted a big, fancy house. I wanted a $3 million rally Bentley car. I wanted a private helicopter. But there was a point in time where I walked into my closet and I saw $30,000 worth of clothes and I was ashamed of myself because my cousins were still putting needles in their arms. My family was still in the gutter. And at that point in time, many people that have known and seen me for a while know that five years ago, you wouldn't see me walking around with less than five, excuse me, walking around with less than a thousand dollars worth of clothes on. It just wasn't happening. But at the point in time I walked in, I grew up my entire life thinking, you know what, if I just make enough money, I'll be happy. If I've got a nice house, I'll be happy. If I've got a nice car, I'll be happy. And you know what, at that point in time I had, I had a nice house. I had a nice car. I had an amazing wardrobe. And you know what I wasn't? Happy. I wasn't happy. It was at the point in time that I realized after I obtained all of those things that happiness did not come from the materialistic things around me. Happiness came from peace of mind. It came from a relationship with the Lord. And it came from nothing more than experiences and friendships with my family and friends. I was very happy when I was running around in the hood with my friends. I was not very happy with a badass car, five or six badass cars, badass house, nice bank account. None of that made me happy. I'm sitting there with a high, high net worth going to sleep with a 38 special in my mouth. Why? Because I still carried all of the demons of my past in my head. I am still dealing with the demons of my past in my head. It is extremely difficult for me to work and network in a room of people because I feel like an outcast. I do not feel like I belong here. I feel like I should be dead, just like my sister. I feel like I should be dead, just like my brother, just like my cousin. I feel like I should be in prison. I don't feel like I should be here. I am only here for one reason. I am desiring to change your life. And that might sound cliche as all hell, but when you look at the price tag I've put on it, when I look and see how much value I'm providing it, I would like to see someone to point at me and argue differently. I don't need anything more than more experiences with my child, more experiences with my wife, and more experiences in this life. And if I can get that out of this life, I will be happy. I do not care about having a $100 million net worth anymore. I do not care about having anything anymore than life experiences and to provide as much value to the people that I possibly can. That is my why now. It was my wife, it was my two kids, and that's me. At the point in time I walked into my closet and I saw $30,000 worth of clothes, if anybody's watched me on Papelio TV, I wear nothing more than a charcoal gray t-shirt every single day. For the longest time, I wore nothing but board shorts. But what I gathered and I've learned through wearing the board shorts over the years is many people in this room never would have listened to me had I wore those today. Looking at my legs, I've got the word betrayed down that side, the word abandoned down that side. It says deceived around my ankles. Whenever I stand up on stage and I speak in front of groups of 700 people, they see my tattoos. They see how I'm tattooed from head to toe. And they see what those tattoos say. And they automatically judge me and they assume because of that, that my speech is no longer valuable. So I hide that nowadays. I stop showing people that so that way I can at least cross their mind before they judge me. And what I hope from the end of the day is that my dead sister, if there was anybody in this room that's ever had to deal with the pain and the lifestyle that I've had to deal with or anybody that's had to deal with struggling, everybody, everybody has struggled. I will never downplay everybody's struggle. But if anybody in here has ever felt hopeless, if anybody in here has ever felt the lack of opportunity, if I could provide that to you today, then I have served my sister well. That was her boyfriend after he got his face bashed in after a botched drug deal. I know that a lot of what I'm speaking on right now is life that y'all may not want to hear, but it's what I am passionate about. So I hope today that I was able to provide some value to you and I'm going to leave you with that quote, and that is the end of my day.
messages close up here. Look, a few things. The next events we've got um, posted over here on the board. Now you guys are heading out. Thank you guys for coming. Real quick, anyone in here signed up with Propelio already? Man, he'll be the first one. Plus, you're, you're a real estate professional. <laughs> Look, if you want one of these, come up here. But uh, if you want one of these, come up here. It's a portfolio bracelet. <clears throat> Remember why you started is what it said. Thank you guys for coming. Have a great night. See you all next time. Thanks, man. Thank you. That's a good job. Thank you. Gotta stay closer. <laughs>